Is there Jackie Smith? Hi. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm going to be your student nurse today. How Hi. are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. And come on back to the sure. office. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching her as she walks back. Just be careful in these chairs. They're very slippery. So what brings you here today? I need a physical. I got a new job. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And what time was your appointment? It was for 10.15 this morning. Great, mm -hmm. and it is 10.15. So um, thus far, I've noted several things already about my patient. I noted that she's alert and oriented to person. She knew her name when I called her from the office. Place, she came to the right doctor's office. Time, she's here at the appointment time. And event or situation, she's here for a physical because she's got a new job. I noticed that when she walked from the waiting room into the office, that her gait was steady. She wasn't leaning or limping. Um, her posture was erect, and as she's sitting, her posture is erect. I also noted that she's making excellent eye contact. If somebody's not making good eye contact, it could be cultural. Uh, in some cultures, you're not supposed to look somebody who's an authority in the eye. And um, she could be nervous or afraid or it could be that she's depressed. So she is making good eye contact with me. I also noted when I shook her hand that her skin was warm, dry, and intact. From what I can see, I don't see any concerning scars, moles, bruises. And as I move through the physical assessment, I'm gonna be looking at the skin through each body system. Now, I see that her clothes are well-groomed. She's well-dressed appropriately for the weather. For the weather. It's um, warm outside, so she's dressed appropriately. Um, I noted that she's not wearing everything that she owns, which could be a sign of homelessness if she's got, you know, three layers plus a coat in the middle of summer. Her nail beds were nice and clean and her clothes appear to be um, well laundered. Her hair appears clean. Do you follow any kind of special diet? I try to eat healthy. I eat a lot of chicken, a lot of fish. Try to stay away from red meat as much as I can. All right, so she's following a healthy diet. And about how much water do you drink in a day? I probably drink about eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. Okay, great. I also noticed that she's not showing any signs of distress. She's not wringing her hands or moving around a lot in the chair. And her speech as we're talking is clear and appropriate. All right. That completes the general survey at the beginning. Now, uh, I do want to ask you, are you experiencing any pain? I'm not. Okay. If at any time throughout this assessment, if you experience pain, would you let me know? Sure. Okay, great. Now we're going to start in a head-to-toe fashion. So we're going to start at the head, and I'm going to start by looking at the hair. I'm looking at the texture to see if it's too oily or too dry. Um, those could be problems with nutrition. I'm going to look at the hair also for signs of alopecia, which is male patterned baldness. I'm going to look behind the ears. I'm going to look on this side as well for any skin breakdown or problems behind the ears. Especially if people have oxygen tubing, it can cause breakdown behind those ears, so you want to take a look at that skin. Uh, I am also looking at her face. So I'm looking at her eyebrows and her eyelashes, and they're full. I see that her eyes and her ears are symmetrical. I don't see any drooping of the eyelids. I'm going to, my hands are washed, and I'm going to pull your eyelids down at the bottom. I just want to take a look. The conjunctiva is pink and moist, and the sclera is white, as it should be. I don't see any drainage from the eyes, the ears, or nose. All right, now we're gonna to move to the cranial nerves. We're gonna start with cranial nerve two. Cranial nerve one is the olfactory, and that's testing your sense of smell. We're not going to do that. We're gonna move straight to cranial nerve two. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve, and you need to know the names and the numbers and what each of these nerves does when you test it. So the optic nerve is Cranial nerve two, and you can test that with the Snell and eye chart. When you and I go to the eye doctor and they test our vision, they're checking on a Snell and eye chart. Or you can check peripheral vision for optic nerve two, and that's what we're gonna do. So you're gonna stand behind the client, and you're gonna ask the client to look straight ahead. And then you're gonna bring your hands in three times per side at the top, middle, and lower sections to check that peripheral vision. Ask the client to look straight ahead, and let me know when you see my fingers. Okay, see it? I see it. I see it. Okay, now we're gonna check the other side. Let me know when you see my fingers. I see it. I see them. I see it. And I wiggled my fingers as I brought them in because it's easier with your peripheral vision to pick up on something that's moving rather than something that's holding still. So cranial nerve two, the optic nerve is intact. Now we're gonna stay with the eyes and go to cranial nerves three, four, and six. And one trick that you can remember is that three, four, and six make your eyes do tricks. So another trick that you can remember, these three cranial nerves, is in nursing, 
if a patient has a wound and the wound has had a dressing on top, once it's healed to the point that we take the dressing off, we call that wound open to air, OTA. That's how we abbreviate it. So if you remember these three cranial nerves, three, four, and six, that make your eyes do tricks, as OTA, it's oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens. And these are responsible for checking two things, perla and EOMs, extraocular movements. So we're gonna start with our pen light by checking perla. I'm gonna dim the lights in the room. I'm not gonna dim these because then you can't see well. And I'm going to turn my pen light on. I'm gonna ask the client to look directly at my nose and I'm going to bring the pen light straight in and I see that her left pupil, where I shone the light, it constricted when the light hit it. When I took the light away, the pupil dilated. Now I'm gonna shine it on that same left eye, but look at the right eye. There's something called a consensual reaction. So even though the light is shining on the left eye, the right eye should also constrict and dilate at the same time. So I keep looking at my nose, and I looked at her right eye, and it also constricted and dilated. Look at my nose, now I'm checking the right eye. It constricted with the light and dilated when I took it away. Now I'm checking the left eye. It also constricted and dilated when I took the light away. So that so far is the pupils are equal. I see that they're round and they were reactive to light. Now I'm gonna check the A portion of Perla, which is accommodation. So I've brought the lights back up and I've turned off the pen light. I'm gonna ask the client to look straight at the pen and I'm gonna bring it close to your face. You may feel cross-eyed, but that's normal. Okay. So I'm gonna bring it close and she focuses on it. Her pupils constricted when I brought it close and now they dilated when I brought it back to a distance. You saw that her pupils, I mean, you saw that her eyes crossed. That is not accommodation. The crossing of the eyes is just a consensual reaction. They consensually converged. They came together. But the accommodation portion of this is what the pupils did. Because remember, Perla starts with pupils. So this is all about the pupils. What happened when I brought the object closer is her pupils constricted to focus on it. When I brought the object to a distance, they dilated. Close, constrict, distance, dilate. That's why people, when they become 40 or 50, need to get reading glasses because those ciliary muscles no longer constrict like they used to. And that's why we can't read things that are up close and small. We have to put them farther away. So that's accommodation. So we do know that her pupils are equal. They are round, they are reactive to light, and they are reactive to accommodation. So there's two reactions, okay? So that's three and six. Now we're gonna move into four. So for four, I'm going to check her extraocular movements. Again, I don't need the pen light on, but what I need is for the client, don't move your head. Okay. I need you to follow this pen with just your eyes. And I wanna go far off to that upper right section so I can see if her eyes can go really far in each field. And then I'm gonna stop here, I'm making a big H. Back up, I'm pausing in between each. Switch hands so I can go way up high, back to the middle, and back down. Good. So when you and I are talking to each other, we are looking each other face to face. If someone else talks to me, I'll turn my head to look at them. I won't just turn my eyes. So right now what I'm checking is her extraocular movements way out to the other fields. And those were all intact. And the reason that I paused in between each of those sections is because if she had either strabismus or nystagmus, those are eye conditions that when they're put under strain and then they relax for a moment during that pause, either one eye would wander or they would start to move either up and down or side to side and I didn't see either of those. So three, four, and six, the ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens cranial nerves are intact. Moving on to cranial nerves five and seven, this is all about the jaw, okay? So we're gonna ask the client to, um, I'm gonna put my hands on the side of her face. My hands are washed. Right here, the lower portion of the jaw. If you can open your jaw fully, and then clench your teeth tight, excellent. Right here when she clenched, I felt the masseter muscle contract 
Now, um, I'm going to ask you to do a few silly things for me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to give you a trick to help you remember five and seven. So I'm going to ask you to raise your eyebrows, squeeze your eyes shut really tight, puff out your cheeks, and smile really big. Okay. So those are cranial nerves five and seven, the trigeminal and the facial. Now, if you think of Heinz 57 sauce on a hamburger, she's never had Heinz 57 sauce before. So in order to bite the burger, she has to open and clench her jaw, right? That's for, that's for trigeminal eating the burger. But then she realizes after she tastes the Heinz 57 that she doesn't really like it and she makes all these faces. She raises her eyebrows, she squinches her eyes shut tight, puffs out her cheeks and grimaces or smiles. So that's an easy way for you to remember Heinz 57 for cranial nerves five and seven, the trigeminal and the facial. Now, if the patient is non-responsive, they could be in a coma, they could be in a vegetative state or otherwise non-responsive. Obviously, I can't ask them to do those things for me. So there is a way to check cranial nerve uh, five and seven, and that's with checking her corneal blink reflex. So the trigeminal, cranial nerve five, is responsible for the corneal blink reflex when the cornea is touched with a sterile cotton tipped applicator. So you would open the eye, touch the cornea with that cotton tipped applicator, and trigeminal nerve five would initiate the corneal blink reflex, and then seven, the facial nerve, would actually blink the eye shut. Okay, so that's some, another thing that you can do for testing those in a patient that can't respond. Now we're gonna move down to cranial nerve eight, which is the vestibulocochlear, and that has to do with your hearing. It's also known as the auditory nerve. So I'm gonna whisper a number in your right ear. I want you to cover your left ear, and then tell me the number. Sure. Two. Excellent. Now if you can cover your right ear, I'm gonna whisper a number. Four. Excellent. So cranial nerve eight, her uh, vestibulocochlear nerve is intact. Now we're gonna move to cranial nerves nine and 12. And before I test nine or 12, I wanna go ahead and look in the oral cavity. I'm gonna do some examination. So if you can open your mouth just for me, you don't have to say anything. I'm looking at her dentition, making sure she doesn't have any chipped, broken, or missing teeth. I'm looking for any halitosis, which is serious bad breath. I'm looking at the tongue, the mucous membranes, the buccal mucosa. All of that should be pink and moist. I'm looking at the hard and soft palate. I'm looking back at the tonsils and the uvula. Excellent. I don't see any bleeding gums or uh, like I said, any halitosis or anything of concern in there. Now we're gonna move to cranial nerves nine and 12. And so they both have the word glosso, glosso meaning tongue. So I'm gonna ask you if you can open your mouth for me Mm -hmm. using my pen light, and if you can say, ah, ah, excellent. So when she said, ah, this is the glossopharyngeal. What happens when she says, ah, is that the uvula and the soft palate will rise symmetrically, and that's what happened with her. So cranial nerve nine is intact. Now we're gonna move to cranial nerve 12, which is called the hypoglossal. So this is a couple of tongue moves. If I can get you to stick your tongue straight out for me, and if you can move it side to side. Excellent. So her tongue is midline, which is very important. If she had uh, um, neurologic difficulty from an injury or a tumor or any other condition that's neurologic, and I asked her to stick her tongue straight out, if it moved to the side instead of coming midline, that could be a sign of a problem. And I also see that she has excellent tongue mobility. Now we're gonna move to cranial nerve 10. This is the vagus nerve. One way to remember the vagus nerve is at 10 o'clock at night, if you're in Las Vegas, you might start drinking some alcohol. You drink too much of it, and what happens? You start to throw up or vomit, gag. So this is checking, checking the gag reflex and also the ability to swallow. So you have to swallow the alcohol before you can gag, correct? So one way that you could check this is a tongue depressor, and I would put, push it down at the back of the tongue. If I initiate a gag reflex, I know that that's intact but I'm gonna check it by seeing if she can swallow. And while I do that, I'm also going to be checking the thyroid gland. So I'm doing two things at once. So I'm gonna take my fingers and put them on the thyroid gland and ask her to swallow. So the fact that she swallowed, that's cranial nerve 10, so that's intact. And as she swallowed, the thyroid gland moved up and down between my fingers. And that's an excellent way to be able to tell that that's a nice smooth gland. There are no nodules on that. Okay, 
Last cranial nerve is cranial nerve 11. So I'm going to move behind the client for this. It's called the spinal accessory nerve. I'm going to put my hands on your shoulders if you can raise against resistance. Excellent. Now push against my hand and again, push back and now push forward. All right, so cranial nerves are complete. Now we're going to move to the neck. And the first thing I want to do is just palpate the neck, making sure that there's no nodules. It's nice and soft and smooth. Good. Now I want to make sure that the trachea is midline. And it is. I'm going to palpate her carotid arteries only one at a time. And remember when we're just palpating arteries, we're not necessarily, well, we aren't counting for checking a heart rate. What we're doing is we're making sure they have adequate blood flow, that it's not weak or bounding. So I'm going to start. You're going to find the trachea and just move a little bit to the side. I can only check one of these at a time because if I check both, I'm cutting off blood flow to her brain. I could cause her dizziness or passing out. Now I check the other carotid artery and those are both strong and equal bilaterally. And that's important. When we have two of something, they should match. So the fact that they're both strong and equal bilaterally is a very important finding. Now I'm going to take my stethoscope and I'm going to auscultate with the bell of the stethoscope. So you need to put it in your ears. And the bell is not active right now. The diaphragm is. So I need to turn the head and now the bell is active. So the bell I'm going to put on the carotid artery. If you could hold your breath for me and breathe. Hold your breath for me and then breathe. So what we're listening for is something called a brewy and a brewy is indicative that there's a narrowing of the space inside that artery and that's not a good thing. It means you've got some plaque buildup. That plaque buildup can become very dangerous. So you're listening to hear if you hear a whooshing sound and I did not hear a whooshing sound so that's excellent. And I had, if you remember that you have to use the bell for brewy, that'll help you remember that. Okay, so we did the carotid arteries. Lastly on the neck, I'm gonna ask the patient, and she can't really do it in this chair, but in a bed or an examining table, she would lay back at a 45 degree angle. So she's tipped back. Then I would ask her to look to the left, and I'm gonna look right here, right above the clavicle at the base of the neck. I'm looking for any jugular venous distension. It would be a distended skin here. Um, it could even be pulsating or bounding. Um, I don't see that. I don't check the other side because, you can sit up. The reason we only check the right side is because blood returns to the heart on the right side and the atria on that right side. And so if there were um, any dis uh, congestion, the distension would show up on the right side. So that's why we check for that. We're finished with the neck and we're gonna move down to the extremities. We're gonna start with the upper extremities and do everything there and then move to the lower extremities and do the same. So I'm just gonna palpate the arms. I'm checking for muscle tone, even hair distribution, skin temperature, skin color, and any edema. I also see the nail beds are nice and healthy. I'm gonna check her pulses and then check capillary refill. So I'm gonna check the brachial. It's here at the medial aspect, which is close to the body of the anti-cubital space, and that's important to tell us. I check the other side, and those are both strong and equal bilaterally. Next, I'll check the radial pulses that are at the base of the thumb, nice and strong, and that's also strong and equal bilaterally. Lastly, I'll check capillary refill. If your client has nail polish on, you can check on the side by pressing, it blanches white, and then the color returns within two to three seconds. Otherwise, you would check on the nail bed itself. Okay, excellent ca capillary refill. Now I'm gonna ask you to do a few exercises for me. We're sure. checking range of motion. So if you can put your arms straight out for me, and if you can rotate your hands. We're checking her wrists. Then if you can flex and extend, that's checking her elbows. And then if you can circumflex, and then away with circumduct. Any pain with that? No. Excellent. So she has full range of motion in her bilateral upper extremities. Now I'm going to check the strength. The first thing I want to check is her grip strength. It should be strong. I'm going to give her two fingers because I want her to squeeze really hard. If I give her three, it can cause me more pain. 
And if I only give her one, it may be such a small area that I don't get a really good perception of how strong she is. Squeeze as hard as you can. Excellent. Now some patients don't want to squeeze your fingers as hard as they can because they're afraid they're going to hurt you. However, they have to give it their full strength in order for you to pick up on perhaps a very subtle weakness on one side versus another. Now if you can put your arm straight out for me, I'm going to push up along the entire arm and I want you to resist, okay? Good job. Now turn your hands over and I'm gonna push down and ask you to resist. Excellent, so she has strong grip strength and she's able to push well against resistance. So we're done with the upper extremities. We're gonna do the exact same thing on the lower extremities. So I'm going to palpate for muscle tone. I'm gonna palpate for skin temperature, skin color, even hair distribution, and any edema. Okay, I don't see any of that. Everything checks out beautifully. Now I'm going to check her pulses in her lower extremities. The first one is going to be the femoral arteries. You may want to wear a gloved hand. They could have a fungal infection in those skin folds. Um, you want to use two fingers and it's a deep palpation right here in the groin. So you're going to check those femoral arteries and they should be strong and equal bilaterally. The next pulses as we move down the leg is going to be the posterior lateral aspect behind the knee. So it's on this outer aspect. And it's a really deep palpation. And sometimes you have to press, press straight up and hold your thumb on top to really get a good grip to feel that pulse. So it's back here, lateral aspect behind the knee. Sometimes those are really difficult to find. It makes it a little bit easier if you ask the client to lay down and you bend their leg. Let them relax so they're not tightening up those ligaments and it lets you feel that deep pulse a little bit easier. But you can always get a Doppler if you can't find a pulse and put a little bit of the gel and you can hear the pulse on the Doppler machine. Next moving down is going to be the medial aspects of the ankles. So this is your tibial bone on this medial aspect. The fibula is out here. So this bone at the ankle is called the malleolus. This is actually the distal end of the tibial bone. So when I go behind it, the fancy term for this is posterior behind tibialis, behind the tibialis. Don't press too hard, you might obliterate it. Pulses get less strong as you move down. That's normal. Now I'll check the other side. And those are strong and equal bilaterally. The last pulse is gonna be on the top of the foot. So it's gonna be between the great and second toe, midway up the foot, okay? Now she's got shoes on, but you can envision it with me. So here's the great toe. Here's the second toe. I'm gonna to go midway up the foot where the arch begins. I'll check that again on the other side and they should be strong and equal bilaterally. Lastly, I'll check her capillary refill. If she's got thickened toenails or toenail polish, again, I can check that on the side by blanching, releasing and watching the color return within two to three seconds. So I did that on both great toes. Now we're gonna do those exercises, range of motion. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start by checking the hips, then the knees, then the ankles. So if I could get you to lift this leg and out, that's abduction, and bring it back, which is adduction. Now if you can do that again, abduction, adduction. And you can remember abduction. When something's abducted, they could take it away from you. So she's abducting it away from her body, from midline, okay? That's abduction, and then adduction. She's adding it back. Now if I can get you to kick both legs out, that's extension. And now bend, that's flexion of the knees. So far, so good. If I can get you to stick your legs out and rotate your feet, that's checking the ankles. And if I could get you to point your toes down, that's plantar flexion, and then bring your toes up, that's dorsiflexion. Everything's great, no pain with that? No. She has full range of motion in her bilateral lower extremities. Next, we're gonna move to strength. Now, I checked arm strength, both arms at the exact same time, but with the thigh, it's a little harder. So I'm gonna check her thigh strength one at a time because unless she's got a super strong core, it's really hard on your back and difficult to raise both thighs against resistance at the same time. So if you can raise up against my resistance, excellent. And again, and now I'm gonna hold her chair because she's on rollers. I'd like you to kick out please and then pull back. Very strong, kick out, pull back. And now I'm gonna check the plantar flexion and the dorsiflexion with some resistance. 
If you can push down like a gas pedal and pull your toes up to your nose. Push down like a gas pedal and pull your toes up to your nose. Excellent. So she's got um, great strength. She's able to push against resistance. All right, now I need you to stand up. I'm going to check your spine. And if you can face that direction away from me. All right, so the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna look at her spine. Okay, then I'm gonna ask her to bend forward as though she's touching her toes, but only as far as is comfortable. I would put my hand under her shirt and I would palpate the spine for any abnormalities. And again, I'm looking at her skin whenever I'm lifting any part of clothing, I'm looking at the skin for any of those abnormalities. I'm gonna put my hands on her scapula. They should be level. If one scapula is higher than the other, it could mean that she's got an S curvature in her thoracic spine. She does not. I'm putting my hands on her hips, they should be level. If one is higher than the other, it could mean that she's got an S curvature in her lumbar spine. She does not. You can stand up. What I've checked thus far was for scoliosis. Checking the levelness of the scapula and the hips is checking for that S curve, which is scoliosis. Now there's two other problems that I'm gonna assess for, and that's going to be in this upper thoracic spine, something called kyphosis. Kyphosis, if you think of a hunchback, is an outward curvature of the thoracic spine. I don't see that here. And then I'm gonna look at the lumbar spine. A very distinct inward curvature that's abnormal is called lordosis, and I don't see that here either. Okay, so remember, the bending forward with the hands on the scapula and hips is only checking for scoliosis. I'm looking here for kyphosis, and lordosis while she's standing, and she doesn't have any of that. Now we're gonna to move to the chest. I wanna start with inspection. I'm looking for the work of breathing. I'm looking at the chest rising and falling. There should be even chest expansion with every breath. I'm looking for any visible pulsations, which I shouldn't see. And I'm looking at the skin for any concerning moles, scars, bruises, or any visible masses. I don't see any concerning problems, so now I'll move to palpating. I'm gonna palpate for any crepitus, pain, tenderness, masses or palpable pulsations and there are none now i'm going to take my stethoscope and remember i had the bell active so now i need to switch it and make the diaphragm active again i'm going to keep it out of my ears just so i can hear myself speak but you obviously would have your stethoscope in your ears when we auscultate we never listen over clothing or bone so i'm going to start on this right side and i'm going to ask the client to take a deep breath in and out and then on the opposite side, deep breath in and out. These are the bronchial sounds. Next, I'm just gonna move straight down and I'm listening for bronchovesicular sounds. Deep breath in and out, directly over, deep breath in and out. Now I'm gonna go down and a little bit to the side, but never below the bra line. Take a deep breath in and out. This is ves vesicular sounds and deep breath in and out, vesicular. So again, the placement is you start on the right, move directly across, then you move down, directly across, then you move down and a little bit to the side, directly across. We don't go this way, okay? Those lung fields are clear. Now we're gonna move to the posterior thorax and do the same thing. So the first thing we did was inspect. So again, I'm looking for even chest expansion, I'm looking for any concerning moles, scars, bruises, any visible masses. Um, you're not really gonna see any pulsations on the back because the heart is more anterior than it is posterior. Everything looks good. I'm going to start palpating for any crepitus, pain, tenderness, masses, and there are none. Next, I'll auscultate. Now remember I said that we don't auscultate over bone. Well, we have two large bones here, correct? The scapula. So I'm going to listen around the scapula, not directly on it. Remember in the front, we started on the right, went directly over, straight down, directly over, a little down, and then over. Here we're gonna make more of a C shape, okay? I'm gonna start above the scapula, take a deep breath in and out. These are bronchial sounds. Deep breath in and out, bronchial. Now I'm gonna go down, and I'm coming in between the scapula and the spine. Take a deep breath in and out. These are bronchovesicular. Deep breath in and out, bronchovesicular. And now I'm gonna follow that curvature, but not go below the bra line. Deep breath in and out, 
deep breath in and out. Those are vesicular sounds. And you notice that I was comparing bronchial to bronchial, bronchovesicular, bronchovesicular, vesicular and vesicular. Because when we have certain things, they should match. Each of those sounds should match from side to side. Okay, that's why we don't go straight down one and then straight down the other. All right, so those lung fields are clear. Now we're going to auscultate the heart sounds. Remember, we're not counting the beats. We're listening for the heart sounds themselves. They should be appropriate. We should hear S1 and S2, the lub and the dub. We shouldn't hear extra heart sounds. We shouldn't hear murmurs, which is a swishing sound, okay? So we're gonna start on the right side. There's one that we're gonna to listen to on the right side, and all the rest are gonna be found on the left side. So on the right side, we actually need to find some landmarks on the body. It's a little difficult on the mannequin. Um, it's a little bit easier on human beings, but I find the clavicle, and then I'm gonna find the first intercostal space. Intercostal space is between two ribs, the costa, okay? So the first rib is actually hiding under your clavicle. So that first space that I feel under the clavicle is the first in-between rib space, intercostal space. So there's the clavicle, first intercostal space, second rib, second intercostal space, right sternal border. I move right along that sternal border. I listen with the diaphragm again. This is the aortic valve. And here, S2 is louder than S1. Okay. Now, I'm gonna come over to the left side, find the clavicle, first intercostal space, second rib, second intercostal space, left sternal border, and this is the pulmonic valve. The pulmonic valve, S2 is also louder than S1. Now I'm just gonna lift my stethoscope and I know I'm at the second intercostal space. Third rib, third intercostal space, left sternal border. This is herbs point. At herbs point, S1 and S2 should be equal. If the client has a murmur that was so faint you couldn't hear it elsewhere, you may be able to pick it up here because the heart sounds are equal. It does not mean this is the only place that you hear a heart murmur. You can hear a heart murmur in any of these valves, okay? Then we're gonna go to the fourth rib, fourth intercostal space, left sternal border, tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve, S1, is louder than S2. Fifth rib, fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. So the clavicle goes from the sternum all the way out here to the shoulder. So this really is the middle of that clavicle. I know it looks like you're off-centered, but this really is the midclavicular line, fifth intercostal space. I'm gonna put my stethoscope there. And here, S1 is louder than S2. This is also known as the point of maximal impulse. And this is where you're gonna auscultate for an apical heart rate for one full minute, especially if your client has an irregular heart rhythm or if they're taking a medication that can change their heart rate, okay? If, all right, now that we're done with the chest, we're going to lay the client down. It's always best to assess the abdomen with the client laying flat. So my client is now flat laying down. And the first thing that I wanna do here is inspect. So I'm going to inspect for the contour. Do I see any distension, right? It's nice and flat. I'm assessing for any visible pulsations. I don't wanna see that. Any visible masses. Any problems with the skin, any uh, herniations, you could have an umbilical hernia. Uh, problems with the skin would be, again, problematic moles, scars, bruises that I need to inquire about. And I don't see any of that. So the abdomen appears healthy. The next thing I want to do is I want to listen for abdominal bruise. So you know that we have our large abdominal aorta, and off of that, come the two renal arteries and the two iliac arteries that feed down to the legs. So because I'm auscultating for bruise, I wanna flip the head of my stethoscope away from the diaphragm and make the bell active. I put this in my ears, obviously, and I'm going to listen for bruise in those arteries. So the first artery, I'm gonna put my fingers from the umbilicus, three fingers above the umbilicus. I'll put my stethoscope above that, and that's where I'm gonna auscultate for an abdominal aortic bruit. Hopefully I don't hear one. Remember that's a bad sign, it means there's occlusion. 
Now to assess for the renal arteries, I put two fingers above the umbilicus and two fingers over. I mark that spot. This is the left renal artery. Two fingers above and two fingers towards me. Mark that spot with my finger. This is the right renal artery. I don't hear any bruits. Next, I'm gonna go two fingers down and two fingers over. Mark that spot. This is their left iliac artery. And then two fingers down and two fingers towards me to the side. Mark that spot and listen to their right iliac artery. I don't hear any bruits, so that's excellent. Now I wanna turn the stethoscope so the diaphragm is active because the next thing I want to do is auscultate the abdomen for bowel sounds. I like to start in the right lower quadrant because that's where the ilium, the small intestine, and the cecum, the large intestine, join. It's the ileocecal valve. And oftentimes, because liquid stool is coming into that drying chamber that we call the colon, you'll be able to capture at least some bowel sounds here. So I start in the right lower quadrant, and I'm gonna auscultate for, what I wanna hear is five to 35 gurgles within a minute. As soon as I hear five, I can move on. I don't have to wait a full minute. So I heard five to 35 bowel sounds. I move up to the right upper quadrant. Excellent. Left upper quadrant. And then the left lower quadrant. All right, so I hear bowel sounds times four in all four quadrants, positive bowel sounds. The next thing that I wanna do is I want to percuss. I'm going to percuss the abdomen and listen for the tones because when you percuss over bone, it makes a flat sound like this. When you percuss over an organ or a fecal filled bowel, it makes a dull sound. And when you percuss over air, like an empty stomach, it would be a tympanic sound. So I'm gonna start, I put my two fingers down and these two fingers I bend and I tap tap on my nail bed. all the way around the abdomen. And everything sounds as it should. Lastly, I want to palpate the abdomen. I'm gonna start lightly. I'm gonna watch the patient's face and look for any signs of grimacing. Uh, because even when I ask, you know, is that uncomfortable at all? They may not tell me that it hurts, but they're making a facial expression that tells me otherwise. And I'll need to investigate a little further. So I'm gonna start with about two centimeters of depth. And I put my hands on top of each other and I move the abdomen around. Okay, I'm checking mostly for tolerance right now and see if they're having any pain in any area. If they were having pain in a specific area, I would then check deeper last in that painful area. So the patient already told me at the beginning they're not experiencing any pain. So I'm looking at their face, I'm moving the skin all around, feeling about two centimeters, they're tolerating it well. Any problems with that? No? Okay, so now I know I can go a little bit deeper to four centimeters. So this is where I'm really gonna check and see if I palpate something that shouldn't be there. So if there's a really hard area that should be nice and soft, the abdomen should be soft. Okay, nice and soft and no problems with that. Excellent. So my findings there is that the patient's abdomen is non-descended, it wasn't tender, there's positive bowel sounds times four. Now before I finish with the abdomen, I need to point out the different organs. Now I'm gonna set the mannequin up so that you can see where I'm pointing. We're gonna start in the quadrant. This is where the appendix is found. And there's something called McBurney's point. And if you're thinking that based on the patient's symptoms, they may have appendicitis, we use McBurney's point to test for that. And so the test for McBurney's point is you press in gently, and it may be uncomfortable for the client, but it's when you let go quickly that the client really experiences pain because if they are experiencing appendicitis, there's a lot of inflammation in that whole abdominal cavity. And as you let go quickly, it makes it reverberate and that causes a lot more pain. So that's McBurney's point. Up in the right upper quadrant is the liver and the gallbladder. The gallbladder is socked right into that liver. Then in the left upper quadrant, we've got the pancreas here and the spleen. And then we're going to talk about the colon. Starting back at the right lower quadrant, we have the ascending colon, we have the transverse colon, we have the descending colon, and then down here we have that little wiggly uh, sigmoid colon. Okay, so those are the organs in the abdomen. 
Now we're going to set the client up and ask a few questions. So I have a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. When was your last bowel movement? Yesterday. Any problems with that? Any constipation or diarrhea? No. Is there any blood in your stool? No. Okay. Um, any changes in your bowel habits? No. Okay. Now we're going to move to the uh, GU, which is genitourinary uterine. This is where the appendix is found. And there's something called McBurney's point. And if you're thinking that based on the patient's symptoms, they may have appendicitis, we use McBurney's point to test for that. And so the test for McBurney's point is you press in gently, and it may be uncomfortable for the client, but it's when you let go quickly that the client really experiences pain. Because if they are experiencing appendicitis, there's a lot of inflammation in that whole abdominal cavity. And as you let go quickly, it makes it reverberate and that causes a lot more pain. So that's McBurney's point. Up in the right upper quadrant is the liver and the gallbladder. The gallbladder is socked right into that liver. Then in the left upper quadrant, we've got the pancreas here and the spleen. And then we're going to talk about the colon. Starting back at the right lower quadrant, we have the ascending colon, we have the transverse colon, we have the descending colon, and then down here we have that little wiggly uh, sigmoid colon. Okay, so those are the organs in the abdomen. Now we're gonna set the client up and ask a few questions. So I have a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. When was your last bowel movement? Yesterday. Any problems with that? Any constipation or diarrhea? No. Is there any blood in your stool? No. Okay. Um, any changes in your bowel habits? No. Okay. Now we're gonna move to the uh, GU, which is genitourinary. So, the first thing I want to ask her, because she's a female, is about her menses. Are you still having your menses? Yes. Okay. Is it regular? Yes. Is it monthly? Yes, once a month. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any um, extreme or heavy bleeding or pain with that? No. Okay. Have there been any changes with your menses? No. Great. Now we're going to go to the urinary system. Now we're going to move to the urinary system. What color is your urine? It's yellow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it clear or cloudy? Clear. Any blood in your urine? No. Any foul odor? No. Do you have any um, pain or frequency with urinating? No. Do you get up at night? It's called nocturia to no, urinate? Not at all. Excellent. And for my male patient, I would also ask if they have any difficulty stopping or starting the stream of urine because that could mean that the prostate is possibly enlarged. Now I'm going to move to some health promotion questions for you. Do you do your monthly self-breast exam? Yes, I do. Excellent. And do you get your, over the age of 40, do you get your annual mammogram? Yes. Do you see your GYN every year? I do. If you're over the age of 50, have you had a colonoscopy? I have. Okay, and that's done every 10 years. Unless you have a family history of colon cancer or you have a history of colon polyps yourself, in which case it's done more frequently. Now, if my patient were a male, I would ask them if they do a monthly self-chest exam. It's important because men don't realize that a mass on their chest could be breast cancer. They do have breast tissue, and many times breast cancer in men is caught late which can have fatal consequences. So it's important they're doing their monthly self chest exams. I would also ask the male patient if they're getting their, um, if they're performing their monthly self testicular exam while in the shower. It's important there's warm water, it makes it much easier to palpate and feel a change in one of the shapes of the testicles. I would ask that male client if they're over the age of 40, if they're having their prostate checked annually, and if they're over the age of 50, if they're having their colonoscopy done, and it, again, would be every 10 years unless they have a family history of colon cancer or a history of colon polyps themselves, in which case it's done more frequently. All right, wonderful, Ms. Smith. This concludes your physical assessment. Thank you.